So today's webinar uh, is a presentation titled Business Continuity Plan, What Happens When Your Accounts Can't Pay. Uh, we'll save some time for questions at the end, so be sure to use the Q&A tool at the, in the WebEx panel. You should see that on the right side of your screen. And uh, we'll be stopping throughout to ask if you have any questions. Uh, our, pre our presenters today are Matt Scudera and John Prickus from Experian. Uh, Matt is Vice President of Research and Education and an officer of the foundation. And prior to CRF, he spent the past eight years with Coach as a Divisional Vice President, Financial Shared Services. Matt has a BA in Business Administration, an MBA in Finance, and having earned his CCE credentials from the National Association of Credit Management. Product, uh, John Crickus is a Senior Product Manager for Experian, responsible for business scoring solutions. John has been with Experian for 12 years, and prior to that, John worked for Receivable Management Services, deploying scoring and other business data to increase the effectiveness of both first and third party collections. John started his career in finance and earned his CPA in the state of New Jersey. And so, Matt, um, welcome to the, the webinar, and uh, I'll hand things over to you. Gary, thank you very much, and uh, let me start with a thank you to our audience for joining us today. Um, we are certainly in a, uh, an environment that we have never seen before, and I truly appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedules uh, to join us um, for a webinar that I think is going to be pretty interesting for folks. Um, before we move into um, the next slide and let John walk us through a number of concepts and strategies, um, I want to thank the Experian organization for hosting this webinar. Um, Experian is a platinum partner of CRF, um, and so we are extremely grateful for the support that they provide us, not only is it economic support, um, but the Experian organization has been a very active member with educating the community um, with us, and that would be through webinars, through articles, and in-person in speaking engagements at our forums, and um, we're extremely appreciative of that. Um, and I wanna thank John for uh, joining us today and taking time out of his schedule uh, to share some thoughts on the, um, the changing landscape um, and what it means to us and a way to approach that. From the CRF side, um, we've heard from our practitioners. We've done a number of surveys recently um, and received some direct feedback, and that is that uh, folks are busier than ever. A lot of folks throughout the country working from home, so adjusting to the three pillars of what they do, their people, their process, and their technology. They are working on cash preservation, uh, both internally for their own companies that they work for, but also trying to manage cash uh, receivables from their customers. Um, and what's worked previously may not be working in this very um, uh, fluid and, and dynamically changing environment. So uh, John's gonna share some thought leadership with us on his approach to credit collections and the function, uh, given the new landscape. And um, I'm excited to, uh, to listen again to what John has to say. Um, so, John, why don't we pass the baton off to you, and if you don't mind it, uh, you know, take us through some of the uh, content that you have. Terrific, and thank you very much, Matt. And I've moved on to a uh, slide, receivable management issues will grow exponentially. We are definitely in an unprecedented time, and I hope everyone is, is staying safe. And we're in a very challenging time, especially when it comes to receivables. All of us are facing a significant increase in accounts going delinquent. And I'm sure that's why we have such an amazing turnout for today's session. And this is going to happen in a matter of weeks. And it's going to happen potentially by multiples, just as we're seeing the unbelievably large number of unemployment claims. And yet, many organizations are still going to have the existing resource constraints. They're not going to be able to scale up in such a short period of time. So what we're going to talk about today is how to face this dual dilemma in order to have the maximum cash generation possible. So as we go through, let's think, as we go through the process, let's think of these key questions. What type of projected increase are you facing as you look at the type of delinquent accounts that you have, the type of businesses, the areas of the country that you're working with? What type of cash flow objectives does your business have? Some businesses may be in better shape than others. And what are your resources? Do you have the resources, people and tools, to meet the significant spikes in delinquent accounts? Given these answers to the above, 
what changes in policies and resources are needed. And you're going to need to do it fast. And again, we're going to go through some strategies that you'll be able to adjust based upon your situation. I wanted to mention that we do see questions coming in, and we will uh, uh, look to answer those as uh, logical breakpoints in the presentation. So we suggest a three-step process to face this unprecedented crisis that we all are in. First, starts with assessing the situation. What challenges is your, is your business facing? What type of resources do you have available for receivable management? Are you going to be able to pull on other departments? Within your financial organization, are more resources going to go into this area? You're going to need to know what your recoveries are going to be. Obviously, everybody wants to say maximum, but realistically, what type of recoveries does the business need in order to continue operating? And then most importantly, what type of strategies are you willing to consider for boosting recoveries? And alternate solutions for troubled accounts. You know, this is not a normal time, obviously. So the traditional rule that accounts age and you move it from internal collections to potentially collection agencies, potential legal, legal collections, that may not be the process that you're going to want to engage in, um, given what has hit, hit the country, what has hit certain segments of the economy. And so every business is going to have to sort through that and come up with uh, what type of alternate solutions you're going to look to have for businesses down the road. So after you've assessed the situation, now we want to look at strategy. And we're going to want to look to force multiply, a great term, force multiply with tools, analytics, scores, um, we're going to talk about uh, a COVID map that, uh, uh, that you'll have access to. A score-driven strategy can maximize both results and efficiency for a large portfolio. We all are familiar with the credit score, so that's about delinquency. And we definitely want to use that to segment accounts. But there are also business failure or default scores that are going to identify the businesses most at risk. And then there's also recovery or collection scores that are available. So these are for the significantly delinquent accounts to assess where the best chance of collection are. Finally, we need to act. After you've assessed, discussed your strategy, you should now have the segments that you want to prioritize. You will have the strategies in place based on potentially accounting for where the COVID-19 risk is and other score analytics are. And unleash your resources. Unleash the resources to focus on segments that will generate the payments and cash flow your business needs. The, the flip side of that is saving resources, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about as well, where not to spend time, and thinking about the alternate solutions for those lower priority accounts. So we're going to go through this, this three-step process. The objective is to maximize cash flow. We're going to need to first start with a base strategy. But then we're going to need to assess that strategy based upon different needs of a business. And we'll talk about two specific areas. These are really adjustments and what specific objectives of your business are. And then we're going to present two potential plans of attack for a receivable portfolio. Now, there are many plans that can be derived from the tools we're going to talk about here. And obviously, your company has its own uh, company culture and objectives that will also influence the final plan. So let's start with a base strategy for increasing recoveries. And this is pretty much a strategy we would have in what's called normal times from 60 days ago. What you see here in the grid is going at, from the uh, left to right at the top end of the scale is a credit score, a payment delinquency score. So we have low scores to the left, high scores to the right. High scores means there's less risk. Low scores means there's higher risk and more likelihood of delinquency. On the axis going up and down the vertical axis, we have a business failure score. So again, low score means higher risk, high score means lower risk. Now traditionally, we would focus on accounts in the, green, in the green box. Accounts that were paying slow, but were at a lower risk of failing. With the theory that the accounts in the yellow box have 
good scores in each area, if they're delinquent, a large number of those are going to probably self-cure. The orange box would be one that we would not only contact, but probably expedite actions. We'd be quicker to advance these accounts through the collection stages, going to a final demand collector, potentially going to an outside collection agency, again, during, during normal times. The white box at the bottom right of high score and low score uh, is going to be unusual. It's very unusual to have good payments and to be at a high risk of business failure. So you're not going to see too many of those. It's going to probably be some type of special circumstance involving legal filings or some area like that as to why they might score that way. So this would be a traditional strategy to serve as our, our base strategy. But we know we're in a different time. And as we look at what is going on in the country, Experian has developed a COVID-19 map. This is uh, free to, to anybody who goes to the, uh, to the website. It's up at the top right, and Gary, I believe you're going to send out the link through the chat function. And what this does is it looks at the COVID statistics, uh, also looks at industry indicators. So it's a combination. You can go down to uh, the state level, industry level. And the suggestion here is we're going to want to look at the COVID impact. We can't ignore it. I've had the question of how will scores perform in this COVID environment? Our scores, uh, statistical scores, have worked during other crises, uh, during the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Um, to a lesser extent, when there was the 2014-15 uh, downturn in the oil uh, areas of the country, when oil prices last declined, not, not like now, but when there was a, a decline in prices then, the scores still rank order. So this, as, as we discuss the scores going forward, we're still going to have that. But obviously, with this unbelievable new impact of COVID, we have to take into account, for example, uh, on this map, which, by the way, you can click on state and get different rankings by state and different industries with highest risk and lowest risk. It's no surprise that entertainment, uh, food services, accommodations, retail trade are highest risk industries. And we're going to need to take that into account when we look at, at the scores as we go through these strategies. And also industries with lower risk, uh, such as education, healthcare, utilities, public admin, uh, are going to be at lower risk, and we're going to need to take that into account also. So we had our base strategy, and now we're looking at adjustments based on the, the COVID impact. Our first adjustment will be thinking about your business. If you're dealing with a lot of industries that are in very bad shape, you're going to need immediate cash. You're looking for immediate cash. Who can now? If you're fortunate enough to have a diversity of industries not concentrated in those industries most being impacted by COVID, you may be able to stay closer to a traditional strategy to maximize your resources. Because, again, the uh, highest scored accounts in both sectors you, in normal times will self-cure. But will that really happen in this environment? It may depend on the area, the harder hit areas versus lesser hit areas of the country, and the harder hit industries versus the lower hit industries. So now what I'd like to do is, uh, Matt, if I could turn it back to you for a few points here before proceeding. Yeah, sure. That's perfect, John, and thank you. Um, I want to stay with the concept of adjustments and uh, adjustments by the credit community. As they opened with, um, you know, CRF is a research firm and uh, and completely focused on uh, credit and collections. And you know, our our membership uh, does a lot of polling with us, so we do a number of surveys and receive a, um, a very good amount of direct feedback. Uh, what I found is, and this is as recent as last Wednesday. 
um, that 27% of the firms have already adjusted their scoring. So John was walking through methodology and, and mentioned some scoring activity. Um, and we found that 27% uh, of the firms have already made adjustments to the way they're viewing their portfolio, right? So looking at it from a portfolio management standpoint and then drilling down to their individual companies. Um, and what I found, find interesting is that the, the adjustments are on two fronts. It's on the internal weighting of their own data, number one. And the second is they're starting to add in new types of scores. So um, what you've heard John talk about would be um, scores on delinquency, scores on default. And there are a number of firms out there that are coming up with very similar scores, but in a very tight time frame. So where historically those default scores or delinquency scores may have had a view of 30, 60, 90, 180 days, or maybe a year out. Um, the new methodology and the new thinking is to tighten those up to look in the very short term. So within a four week period, um, say, or a six week period, what could potentially happen to this firm because of that uh, tightening of and criticality of uh, cash conservation. So that, that's one type of um, adjustment that's taking place. The other type that I think is um, interesting also is, and I'll refer back to the, um, I'll call it the heat map that John presented on one of the previous slides, where it was the map of the United States. Um, there are um, many leading credit practitioners now that are taking information very similar to that, if not that, and bringing that into their models. So it's this new way of thinking in a very short term that becomes um, very critical to, uh, to individuals. Um, like I said, many firms adding new scores and data to their assessments. Um, and as they do that, and John talked about strategy, the feedback we're getting from our community is now that the, the discipline has a seat at the front table with their senior leadership. And that's because they have to align their short-term business strategy to their customers' risk and collections and they have to go in and do that immediately. So depending on where you fit within the economy, and um, you know, John talked about you know, there are many different industries. Um, you know, some are in better shape than others. Uh, and because of that, each firm has its own position on what's important to them. And so they have to take that strategy and apply it to the scoring models, the process, and the actions that they're going to take. So can, kind of aligning um, actions to your environment is what's critical here. And so, uh, again, I wanted to share what some of the current adjustments are and what people are doing. And just to, to reiterate it, um, have already adjusted scoring models um, and or many firms continuing that, um, adding new types of data in there, um, relevance uh, changes to their own data, right? Weighting changes to their own data, um, but getting very um, specific on short-term scores and views of their information and aligning their strategy as they sit with their uh, corporate executives. Um, so thinking short term as well as long term. So John, why don't I pass it back to you? You can continue on uh, through the next couple of slides. Thank you, Matt. Excellent points. And before moving on, let me just answer a couple of questions that were put up here. Um, and they're related. The questions are related to the loans that are going out under the CARES Act. Uh, now I'm not a CARES Act expert. I have read a number of articles and, and read a summary uh, of the legislation. Um, so let's first of all separate the fact that there are different types of loans out there. Um, SBA has its traditional loans, and those are traditional loans like a bank where, you, you know, you have to pay that back over time. But the SBA uh, and, and through the banks have n new types of lending, and one question was about the PPP loans, the Paycheck uh, Protection Plan loans. And while they are loans, as long as you're applying uh, the PPP loans to keeping your workforce on the payroll and paying them uh, over the time frame, I believe it's two months or three months, the loan is totally forgiven. Um, pretty sure on that? Uh, again, please uh, you know, check the, the, the lot of written material that is out there. Um, and I do not believe they're being secured by UCC filing, the PPP loans. Again, uh, please, please don't quote me on that, but uh, these loans are meant to be forgiven. And uh, they're, so they're different from a traditional loan that is out there. There's also a smaller pool of money uh, for emergency loans. And uh, I'm not as well versed on that. Uh, most of what I've been working on has been the PPP loans. Um, so there are emergency loans that businesses can get to also keep them afloat, but that's 
that's not as as widespread. And John, if I could add a comment on the uh, PP loan, PPP, three P's in there loan. Um, CRF did a um, an educational piece with um, an organization by the name of Aaron Fox. So this is a um, a recorded session that is out on our website. Um, we passed it out to uh, the entire credit community, um, and it is a review of the CARES Act and uh, what can happen and and what uh, does not happen. Uh, and it, it takes two points of view on there. It's the point of view number one that's what's relevant to your business to continue to operate but also from the credit practitioner standpoint, number two, it's information that they could share with their customers to help them through the process. What's included, what's not included, what's eligible, what's not eligible, um, terms of the loan, things along that line. So again, um, it's out on the CRF website, crfonline.org, uh, and it was done with the Aaron Fox uh, uh, law firm and a uh, real good piece for people to, uh, to take a look at. About 40 minutes long, so I apologize. It takes a little time to get through it, but it's very informative. Sure, yeah, Matt. Thanks for yeah. that. You're welcome. Thank you. So now we're going to move into actual strategies, development of actual strategies. Now keep in mind we started with the base strategy from, from what we'll call normal times uh, of focusing on accounts that are going to pay slow but will pay and letting the really good scoring, good quality accounts uh, cure without having to put out any extra effort. But we talked about there's two adjustments we may need to make to that. One is the COVID map, as we've, as we've talked about here, um, where it's hitting the country hardest, what industries it's hitting, by geography, by industry. And the second is you, your business's objectives. As you assess your business with immediate cash generation, I know we all want to say that is 100%, but again, if you are fortunate to deal with businesses um, that are not as stressed, uh, you may not have to shift to that area as much. So those are the two, two adjustments that we're going to have to talk, talk about. So now having looked at those adjustments, um, we can, can now look at two strategies based upon whether uh, we want to have that immediate cash generation or we want to maximize that cash. So immediate cash, meaning we need cash now. You know, our business needs that cash flow. We don't have any patience. Um, you're going to want to go after the low-risk region and industries from the COVID map and the highest scores for both measures. So remember, our two scores were assessing payment delinquency and business failure. And if we need to maximize cash and you're faced with a large amount of delinquencies, much more than you're, uh, you have been used to dealing with, much more than the resources you have available, we want to go after the low-hanging fruit across the board, and even then it may be tough. So we want to go after those low-risk regions and low-risk industries and the one with the best scores, because before this crisis hit, those scores were ranking these businesses at the top. That will be the way to generate immediate cash. If we want to maximize cash, there's a couple of approaches here that we could take. One approach, and then again, based on your firm's objectives, your firm's uh, corporate atmosphere, how you want to approach businesses in this, in this crisis, there, there are a number of ways that we could look at maximizing cash. The strategy that I put forward here would be you want to go after the highest scores for both measures, businesses that were strong, but you may want to go after the high-risk region in industries uh, because the low-risk region in industries and high scores will have a better potential to self-cure over time. So if you can be a little more patient, the way you will maximize cash over time will be to uh, go after good scoring accounts in high-risk regions and industries. And again, you could adjust that based upon some of the factors and information that Matt was talking about. A second priority, after you've uh, gone after the, the uh, number one targets, so now if you're talking about needing that immediate cash, really you're going to take what was priority one for maximized cash to be priority two for immediate cash. You've already attacked the low-risk regions and industries per the COVID map. Now you're going to go after the high-risk region and industries, but you're still going to go for the highest scores. Again, high score means low risk, just like our, our own consumer score, right? Uh, you want to have a, an 800. That means you're low risk versus a 550. That means higher risk. 
So if you need that immediate cash after you have put your resources against the low risk for everything, now you'll go after the higher risk in region and industries, uh, but have, who had good scores. The opposite would happen for the maximized cash. Um, hopefully some of these have self-cured, the ones that had the low risk region in industries and had the, the low risk from the score point of view because they had the highest scores. Um, this, is, this is one that really will use the, the least resources. But again, the, the media cash need would be in a different order. And then we really don't have a difference as we go down the scale. And I'm going to jump to number four, um, high-risk industries, uh, high-risk areas of the country, low scores. These are going to be very tough. These are going to be very tough to collect on in this environment. So you're going to want to make those accounts the, the last activity uh, that you uh, utilize, the, the last resources that you have will go here because you really want to spend your time on the prior three groups in order to, to maximize the uh, maximize the cash both immediately and over time. And again, Matt did a very good job talking about all the other factors you may want to take into account. We started with a base strategy. We went through two adjustments based upon your business's needs and based upon the COVID situation, both by region and by industry. And here on, the, on, on step three, we have sample strategies based upon You've got limited resources with this avalanche of delinquent accounts come, coming at you. Um, you need to prioritize because there's, there's no way in the world you're going to be able to treat all those accounts equally uh, with the resources you have. And if you did, you'd be spending very little time on every one of them. You want to spend time that's going to generate cash uh, in the short term because some of these areas are going to be very tough uh, to collect on at any time. Now, I want to end the strategy part by talking about the severe delinquency accounts. And the strategy here uh, changes slightly, but re really probably not too different from good times. And this is looking at what you see here at the top is a uh, late stage delinquency score um, and a business failure score. Those are the two that we put the grid on. And really, you're going to want to focus on the high scores for both. Because once accounts get to 120 days, um, they're in very bad shape, and especially in this environment. Uh, you really want to focus all your efforts to the higher scores. And you're going to have to think about your alternate strategy for the other accounts. And again, it, it, being sensitive to the times that we're in while also needing to generate cash potentially having to look long-term about clients or customers that you want to have, you know, four, five, six months from now, uh, that's going to vary from company to company. So focusing on the best of both when it comes to scores. Now, we've touched on a lot of scores. So what we want to do is just briefly explain uh, how scores are, are built and what their purpose is in life. And we're going to start with the delinquency score, and we're going to talk about two methods now that are used to build scores, logistic regression and machine learning. But before going uh, in depth into our first score, the delinquency score, which predicts slow pay, uh, Matt, uh, I know you had some comments on the changing environment that we're in. Yeah, thank you, John. What I want to really do is I want to emphasize the importance of uh, think, uh, changing the way you go out your portfolio, so your strategy on um, uh, what's important. And um, what we're finding at CRF is that it is really about the near term today, right? So it's about getting to the next invoice or getting to the next receivable that is um, really critical to most firms that are out there. Um, and with that, think about the, uh, the way you utilize data uh, and scoring in particular. And um, you may want to have two points of view. One is that short-term point of view, getting to the next invoice getting to the next uh, receivable. Um, and the other one may be a little bit more longer term view um, in you know, that relationship side of your business, right? Maintaining that customer uh, and maintaining the, uh, the health of that organization. So it ties back to the, the strategy, again, sitting at the table with your senior leadership, defining what your short term and your long term objectives are, very similar to the four box model that John's been going through, and then applying that to your data sets 
Um, and so in some cases that requires folks to think about pulling in new sets of data, i.e. short term, which they may not have had before, um, and or um, looking at a long term, pulling in data sets for the long term. So regardless of who your provider is, um, many firms have now short term and long term um, scores and, and data available. Um, best practice here seems to be that uh, you know firms are applying both of those in their strategy with a preponderance of the focus on the short term, again, getting to the next invoice, getting to the next uh, collection opportunity. Um, and so maintaining their short term health so they can think about long term objectives. Um, so again, think about those new opportunities that are out there and, uh, and applying that into your business. Um, John, why don't you keep going with your um, train of thought that you had there? Terrific. Th thank you, Matt. And um, one of our, our uh, participants um, has sent in that uh, UCC filing is not required uh, on, the, on the PPP loans. So uh, thank you, Carlene, for providing, uh, providing that answer. All right. So we started talking about scores that predict uh, delinquency. And we're going to talk about the two model approaches on the next slide. Um, we're using for an illustration here our small business financial exchange score. And one of the uh, more easy ways to explain how a score works, there are various terms. Uh, you may have heard KS statistic. You may hear of a, of a Gini statistic. Um, bad capture is, is, is very intuitive. And what it's saying is if, uh, if we rank accounts uh, from, from lowest score to bottom, bottom 10%, to the highest scores. So on a, if we were to rank them percentage-wise, 1 to 100%, which, which everybody understands. Um, and we had a certain number of bads in that portfolio uh, or in a, a group of applicants. Um, how much of the bads would the, the scores capture at the bottom? Because we're rank ordering. Bottom is the low score, highest risk. Uh, the higher scores means lower risk. And in this example of a credit score, a delinquency score, we see the bottom 10% capturing almost 30% using a logistic regression model, 34% using a machine learning model. The bottom 20% captures just about half of the bad accounts. So the power of that is that you can quickly segment accounts. Um, and again, in normal times with new applicants coming in, that bottom 20%, you're getting rid of you know, half of your risk. And uh, you may have policies where you don't even approve anybody below a certain level, or you might require deposits or lower credit lines. Um, again, it would be, be specific to, to your business. So we're going to go over some odds charts like that, but uh, more like this in the other scores. But th this is for delinquency. We want to capture the more likely accounts that are going to be delinquent in the bottom scores. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the two approaches uh, to model development. And they are logistic regression, regression and machine learning. Logistic regression has been around for, for a long time. Uh, for those of you who took statistics classes, that's, you're probably doing logistic regression uh, all the time. Machine learning is a more recent development. Artificial intelligence is another term that can be used. And um, I'm not going to go in depth uh, into that because that's the purpose of the session, but it does look at data more detailed and run it through various scenarios to come up with a more predictive model. At Experian, what we do is the machine learning model's been frozen and implemented, so it's not changing all the time. We did that so the adverse action codes um, can be explained uh, specifically and directly um, versus having a model that's constantly changing, which would make it more difficult uh, for the adverse action codes. For a delinquency model, we're predicting uh, 90 days past due. Uh, it can be from 12 to 24 months. The SBFE model goes uh, out to 24 months. And the main data feeding the model is going to be payments, credit utilization, public records, uh, industry. Um, you can also use, if you have permissible purpose, uh, the guarantor, uh, the business owner, as long as, they, again, you have FCRA permissible purpose, and we can blend that information together. So therefore, you get two score types. One's a commercial only, if you don't have permissible purpose. Or you could get a blended or owner-only model. Owner-only means we didn't have business data in the database. Um, and again, you have to have the FCRA eligibility. So that's a delinquency score. Now let's talk about a business failure score. So these are the businesses that the highest risk for failure or payment default, because a lot of small businesses uh, don't file bankruptcy papers. So we, 
we identify as a proxy those that have a very high percentage of their their payments uh, being not paid or, or being 90 day past due delinquency. And what we see here with the business failure score, so we use the financial stability experience, financial stability risk score, is again bad capture. And it's even stronger with uh, business failure versus payment delinquency. We're able to capture 74% of all the businesses that are going to go bad uh, in the bottom 20% of scores. Now, if you were to score your entire portfolio, um, you may see a shift down given the environment we're in, more businesses paying delinquent. Um, the top 20% of scores, you may only have 10% of your portfolio in it because people are, businesses are stressed and, and they're not able to perform the way they were just a short time ago. It's still rank ordering though. Uh, the bottom 10% may contain now 20% of the portfolio instead of, uh, usually we see client portfolios is actually lower weighted at the bottom because they're doing credit checking up front. So the bottom 10% now may have increased from where it was uh, uh, just a few months ago. But the, the point of the, about financial stability risk, about business failure, like with delinquency, is to capture at the bottom end of the score scales the accounts that are more likely uh, to fail. And then finally, I want to go into the third score that we were, we were, we were using earlier, um, which is the uh, re collection or recovery score. So these are for the severely delinquent accounts that are ready to go to collection. Um, and again, we're in a different time. But one thing that all these scores we're looking to use, all the analytics, some of the things that Matt was talking about that you want to integrate in, your, your, your own business's uh, uh, you know, uh, specific situations, is we want to avoid wasted time. Uh, we don't want to spend resources where it's not going to yield uh, very much or anything. Now, the one difference when we look at performance charts for a collection score is instead of looking at the bottom scores where we're trying to avoid the bads, with a collection score, we're looking at the top end because that's where collection is going to happen. The businesses that are, relatively speaking, are in better shape. And you can see here the top 20% of scores yield about uh, 45 to 62% um, of, of the uh, numbers, you can see the numbers, 62% of the dollars. 62% so of the dollars the top 20% of scores, 72% of the dollars in the top 30%. So the one difference with a collection score is you're looking at the high, high, high scores because it's really not worth, as this next chart illustrates, spending a lot of time uh, working on the bottom end accounts. Now, I'm using here, Experian has a recovery score, and I'm using a chart for this. It's, it's on a, um, a, a 300 to 850 scale, but we've put it for recovery rate on the right-hand axis. So the line, the purple line, is the recovery rate. And you can see the best scored accounts are to the right, the lowest scored, uh, lowest, excuse me, the best recovery accounts are to the right, the lowest accounts are to the left when it comes to recovery rate. So you can see 626 to 650 um, has a recovery rate uh, of around, 5%. Now, the left-hand scale is the distribution of accounts. So you can see the fifth blue bar over is a little over 6%. That's 401 to 425. And then as you keep going to the right, you get distribution. The highest bar, 651 to 675, represents 11%. So that's the distribution of accounts, with the purple line being the collection rate. What is very useful here, and this is, again, where you're going to save huge amounts of resources, is that when you look at the left-hand side and the five bars, the one that's a little over six and the other four, which roughly add up to about 20%, accounts below 425, that score below 425, that bottom 20% has practically zero collection rate. Now, in the prior world, 60 days ago, we might have just sent these to legal collection right away. Uh, again, we're in a new environment. Um, we want to be sensitive to, to where people are. Your, your company may have different policies. We'll leave that to you to, to determine and your business to determine. Uh, but from a collection point of view and using resources, uh, I really would not spend any resources at all on accounts scoring below 425, even below 525, where you get another 6-7% of the accounts. On the other hand, you would spend most of your resources uh, on accounts where you're getting a collection rate of 20% or above, definitely 
that'd be seven seven oh one and above. Um, and depending upon your resources, you can go further down the scale. So real powerful uh, uh, illustration here of how scoring can save on resources and focus the resources on the accounts that, that are going to matter. So let me summarize uh, before a couple of uh, closing comments. When we look at developing a receivable management matrix, Mainly we focused on first what we call first party collections, your your your, your existing portfolio, uh, the 30-day delinquent, 60-day delinquent accounts. We've got to understand the challenges your businesses are facing. Uh, what resources do you have available? Project the recoveries. Now we're going to talk about strategy. How are you going to force multiply the tools that you have, both human resources and both technology tools? And you can see here we're strongly suggesting using scoring tools. So you have a score-driven strategy to maximize results and efficiency. Because I'm sure very few of you are going to get the resources that you're going to need um, to face this avalanche of delinquent accounts. We talked about the three scores and, and how they work. Um, and then you can act. Prioritize your strategy. Use the COVID map uh, to integrate into the strategy. Use some of the other indicators that Matt was talking about earlier to integrate in your strategy so you can focus your resources on the segments that are going to generate that immediate cash, that are going to generate that cash flow over time. And almost as important, avoid using resources uh, in the areas where uh, you're, you're not going to generate much cash flow, much, much recoveries or collections. And with that, Matt, I know uh, you have some uh, closing uh, comments. Yes, John, thank you. And uh, great points that you've made uh, all throughout the presentation. Um, as a uh, practitioner, so for 25 plus years, I was a practitioner um, and now uh, doing some education and some research in the field. Um, I find it um, interesting in a number of ways. One of the um, recent polls that we've had found that there may be a little bit of slowness in uh, data transmission that's happening. Um, as, a, um, as a practitioner, we know how important it is to have updated information to make credit decisions. And certainly in these times, it's even more important to have updated information. Um, my, um, my word of advice here and my, my ask would be, um, you know, given that we're in a very dynamic uh, time and, and we're in a data-driven environment is to make sure that people are continuing to share their information with their providers. So I say providers, no matter who it is, um, whether it's Experian or somebody else, um, that you continue that. It's really like a give to get type of environment, right? As you share information, you also get that um, information back from your peer group out there so that you are making the best decisions for your firm. So um, it's really important to continue to share information. Um, you may want to even ask your provider if you have the capability of sharing your information more frequently than you have in the past. Again, this is a community uh, type of statement so that everybody has the most recent information in their credit reports so that you can make the best decisions that you can given your firm's approach and strategy. And, and then as you cross those three pillars of what's important to you, your people, your process, and your technology, that you are implementing the best opportunity that you can for success uh, within your firm. So, um, so really just a, a general statement uh, on that. Um, John, I wanna thank you. Um, you gave us a tremendous amount of information to walk through, right? A strategy to get us to that next invoice. Um, the ability for us to start thinking about the newness of what's going to happen um, and getting us to the point where we get our operations running again um, in a very efficient manner. So, uh, John and the entire Experian organization, thank you. Thank you on behalf of CRF. Thank you for today's uh, webinar. Um, and thank you for all that you do for the community. I also want to say thank you to the audience, right, for listening in uh, to today's session. Um, it was just, um, it's great to have you with us. It's also, um, you know, good to move away from the daily transactional stuff and begin to educate ourselves on uh, what opportunities we have in front of us. Uh, and we truly appreciate you taking the, uh, the time to do that. Um, Don, before um, we close out today's webinar, are there any other comments from you? Um, otherwise, I think we'll call it a, a session. Yes, yeah, so thanks, Matt, and, and terrific uh, comments here to close things up. I just wanted to cover a couple questions that we had. Someone asked about defining recovery rate. So on this uh, chart, which is, again, the recovery or collection uh, model uh, score, uh, recovery rate is much lower. These are accounts that generally are 180 days past due. So we're probably talking about 
you know, 10 to 15 percent total recovery rate for the portfolio. So what that purple line represents is for the very top scores, 826 to 850, you're getting a collection or recovery rate of about 40 percent. You'll collect about 40, 40 cents on the dollar for businesses that have that highest score. Um, and then you can see 751 to 775, which is about 5 percent of the portfolio. If you go to the left hand side of the scale, the bar, and there you're getting a recovery rate if you, if you go up from that third, fourth bar from the right, you're getting a recovery rate around 25%. So for collection or recovery rate, um, that's what that percentage uh, it, it indicates. We also had a question about the scale, the 300 to 850 versus a percentile scale. And one way to think about it is, um, you know, we, we all had grades in, in college and high, sc high school. Everybody in high school probably had the same grading system. A 90 to 100 was an A. Uh, an 80 to an 89 was a B. And so at 300 to 850, think of that as your 90 to 100, 80 to, to 89. Um, and then the percentile, uh, the A and the B, is another way of expressing that. So, um, and then it could also be a percentage ranking in your class, um, you know, where you were. So you may have had an 82 average, but that might have put you at midpoint. So that's a percentile ranking. It's ranking you from 1 to 100%, whereas the grade of 82 puts you at midpoint for, for your class. And uh, so some of these were asking, gee, I don't see the, the 300 to 850. It's not on all the scores that you may see out there in the market. You may see 1 to 100. There's 1 to 5, which is like the A, B, C, D, uh, like grade. Um, so there are various ways of doing it. But uh, Experian and, and, and any bureau will provide you with an odds chart uh, to show you. Another question was about what about when these scores change? Uh, all bureaus experience have monitoring services, uh, alerts, triggers uh, to let you know uh, when, when scores are changing. And really what, what we're suggesting today is not only using those scores, but also taking a look at the, the COVID map, uh, the industries. Uh, the, you may want to really do a, a portfolio review and understand by geography, by, by these various scores, uh, by industry. Uh, where, where your risks are, uh, especially in this change environment. And Gary, I think I got to the questions of this yes. scrolling down, and I'm going to turn it to you for our, our, our closing, closing remarks. Okay. Well, well, thanks, guys. Great job today, and uh, thanks, everybody, for sending those questions in. Apologies we couldn't get the poll question in. We'll have to figure out what happened there. Um, thanks for attending. Thanks to CRF and to John and Matt. Uh, an email will be sent out in follow-up to this with a link to the slides and a, and a copy of the recording, obviously. And uh, for more information on Experian's business information services and products, go to experian.com slash B2B. And for information on Credit Research Foundation, go to crfonline.org. And that's it for today. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe, okay? Until the next time. <laughs>